I hate this book. It was such a profound disappointment. On the Farm is about Robert Bicton, the pig farmer serial killer. I expected in this massive tome an exhaustive explanation of his crimes. I expected to read the guy's full life story and come away with an understanding of who, where, and why he killed. I got the who and I got the where, but why? I'll come back to that. This book is 700 pages long, so forgive me for expecting to know everything about Picton at the end. Really though, this book isn't actually about Robert Picton. He's more of a supporting character. The book is actually about the prostitutes he killed. This is their hagiography. And that is what I found absolutely frustrating. I didn't buy this book to learn about the hookers. I wanted to learn about the killer. Stevie Cameron wrote a love letter to these victims. On the Farm completely absolves these hookers of any agency in their lives. First off, every one of them gets described in some combination of pretty, smart, and loving. I refuse to believe 40-something prostitutes chosen at random are all pretty, smart, and loving. Yeah, I mean, I get it. They're victims, and you don't want to speak ill of the dead. But then just don't say anything. These glowing descriptions of all of them just can't be true. They just can't. We all know it. The life of a drug-addicted hooker on the streets is not a happy one. They aren't going to be wonderful people. And every single one of Picton's victims aren't going to be wonderful people either. That's another thing that bothered me a lot. Cameron just completely wipes away any kind of personal responsibility for their addictions. Uh, she treats addiction like a force of nature that just blew in overnight. Oh no, looks like we got thunderheads coming in from the north. Now you're addicted to crack. All of these women made decisions to start taking drugs. Yes, some of them had lousy childhoods. Yes, some of them got involved with lousy, abusive boyfriends. No one ever held them down and forced a needle full of heroin into them while they screamed and protested. They're human beings with the ability to make choices, and they all made at least one bad choice. And you'll get to read about them in this book. Uh, in this book, supposedly about Robert Picton, you'll get comprehensive life stories of about 15 or 20 of his victims. You'll hear about their childhoods, their families, where they're from. Really, the ones that frustrate me the most are the ones from good middle-class backgrounds. That's not the majority, but there are several who threw away good opportunities to live normal, safe lives. And of course, they're blameless at all times. They had parents who wanted them, they had schools to attend, they had stable homes. Yet somehow they just woke up one day working a street corner in a Vancouver ghetto, aching for a speedball. Uh, but that's not the only frustrating part of this book that is supposedly about Robert Picton. A large chunk of it goes into the dysfunction of the Vancouver Police Department that allowed Picton to operate for so long. That's an important topic, but the sheer level of detail is not. I did not need to hear every detail of the office politics. One incident really stands out. The hero in the Vancouver PD is a guy named Rosmo. I can't remember his first name. Uh, he did some pioneering work in profiling of serial killers, and if the department listened to him, yes, Picton would have been found sooner. However, most detectives, and especially the upper brass, hated him. Cameron describes the fight about Rosmo's office. He claimed a big office on the top floor of police headquarters, the kind of office that bureaucrats compete for decades to get. Rosmo, because of his profiling work, jumped several levels in the hierarchy and had a special status within the department. So he takes this big office because he says he needs the room uh, for his rotating series of interns, not to mention his computers and his maps. Cameron presents all of this as fact, then goes on to belittle the police brass who get their panties in a bunch over it. The thing is though, Rosmo should have known better. The Vancouver PD is a bureaucracy. Rank and status are very important and anyone cutting in line would be strongly smacked down. That's how bureaucracies work. Rosmo acted as if he's in a meritocracy where your contribution determines your rank. 
Am I supposed to believe he's this babe in the woods who just couldn't understand why the higher-ups in the department would hate him? I don't think of Rosmo as the golden child that Cameron portrays him as. I think he was just as spiteful as the brass. They wanted to stick it to him for shaking up their cozy and familiar system and grabbing money, rank, and perks that took them decades to get. He wanted to stick it back to them just as bad. That's why, even though he had standing job offers from dozens of major, respectable police forces and organizations around the world, he stayed in Vancouver and played dumb office games with these people. If his work was truly his number one priority, he would have gotten out of Vancouver and gone to a place where he was appreciated. Oh, but wait, there's more. There's 700 pages to go. On the Farm also dedicates large chunks to the Picton's family's various shady activities. This alone is okay, except for the exhaustive amounts of info given. Again, this book is supposed to be about Robert Picton. Yet you'll also read in detail about his brother Dave building a bar called Piggy's Palace and all the many parties he threw there. Sure, Robert supplied some pork to the palace and might get a hooker from there on occasion, but it's important that you know Dave built much of Piggy's Palace from salvaged parts taken from his demolition business. You need to know in this serial killer story about how Vancouver's mayor once attended a private party there for 30 minutes. So yeah, that's just one of many, many, many bits of family color I learned. Oh, but I also learned something about America from this book about a Canadian serial killer. Apparently, it's an American tradition to eat cherry pie on George Washington's birthday. Even though I've lived in America my entire life, I've never heard of this. Yet the tradition is so widespread that Picton became disgusted with cherry pie as a result of Americans so frequently offering him cherry pie on his one trip to America that happened to coincide with Washington's birthday. Of course, this was in the 1970s, but I guess perhaps we lost this cultural touchstone when we switched to President's Day. Actually, I guess that's a little inaccurate. Uh, I'm not actually sure if Robert became disgusted with cherry pie because of that trip, or did he always hate cherry pie and was just disgusted with being offered it so frequently? Ah, uh, damn. I guess Cameron better revise the book and add an additional chapter to explain. And I guess really that sums up my colossal disappointment with this book. It's 700 pages filled with information and detail I didn't want to know. I didn't need to know that much about the victims, and I didn't need to know that much about the bureaucratic inviting. And yet somehow, the info I did want to know didn't make it into those pages. I only came away with a vague understanding of how Picton killed his victims. I don't have any understanding of why he did it. Okay, he had a weak father figure and an overbearing mother. Is that it? I'm supposed to assume that drove him to kill so many? Couldn't Cameron talk to a criminal psychologist and get some theories? She interviewed Rosmo. Couldn't he have given any insight into what drove Picton to be a killer? Uh, what about the cops who arrested him? Wouldn't they have gained an understanding eventually? I don't even understand his method of killing. He would bring a hooker back to his trailer and kill them there after handcuffing or tying them up. Okay, bondage play. Well, was that because Picton was into bondage, or was it just a ploy to get them vulnerable in restraints? I don't know. Did he do that with every victim or just some? I don't know. Apparently, Picton told a guy that he could kill by injecting someone with washer fluid, and it wouldn't be caught by the cops because it would look like an overdose. Okay, did he do that to anyone? I don't know. If he did, well, why then bother with those restraints? Did he have to kill to get an erection or ejaculate, or was he still able to have sex? Did he dismember the bodies strictly for ease of disposal, or was there a ritual to it? Could that dismemberment be the actual driving force for committing murder? Did he ever actually confess to mixing human meat with ground pork? Did he do it intentionally, or was it just because he was sloppy? So many questions. I read 700 pages, and I still have so many questions. Yeah, 
I hate this book. I feel like it robbed me of my time. Oh, wow. And I didn't even tell you about all the boring court procedures. Ugh. Originally, I was going to say it needs an editor to pare it down to a more reasonable length and cut a lot of the dreary fat from the text. But no, because it still lacks so much information. The book needs a rewrite. I guess I need to keep looking for another book about Robert Picton, something that will actually explain his drive and motivations. And you know what? I, I just realized in, in all this time talking, I didn't even get to explain that whole detail about the gun dildo. What was that about? I... Yeah. Yeah, I'm just at a loss at the end of this book. Well, after talking about murder victims, I guess I feel a little uncomfortable telling you to like, comment, and subscribe, but uh, it seems to be the name of the game on YouTube. <laughs> this is really a great book to kick the channel off with, isn't it?